picture that is that it's all about taste and why is this not working? Okay, I need Alice. Get Larry the it was working earlier, so <laughs> it quit working. Uh oh. Sometimes it's a battery, you know. Well, it was working on its own, right? Oh, no, you it well, had to put it quick. Yeah. On its own. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> well, Oh, folks, everything was working until you all got here. <laughs> <laughs> all the tests. <laughs> what did I do that? I haven't touched this. Errors? Somebody trip over a wire. I mean, <laughs> you see, like Ben, Larry. Um, we need to get Lynn at the front desk. We did. Well, have Lynn, 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 Well, it talks about this stuff. Now we get Okay. Sorry about that. We're back online. Um, thing about fish and weezer, it's all about taste. And uh, you can see the flavor that we have on its side. This is the product that really made us. And uh, it's called roasted raspberry chipotle mm -hmm. sauce. Without that, I don't think we would be where we are today. I don't know how the exact number of how many sauces we make, but boy, that just changed everything from jams and jellies into sauces. I can tell you that last year we cooked 90 million ounces of product. Now we have to use ounces because we bottled five ounce bottles and we found five, we also filled five gallon buckets. And so Jenny keeps everything in crack in 90 million. In, in ounces. And so to give you an idea what 90 million ounces looks like, visualize a swimming pool 20 by 40. Got that? Five feet deep? Got, you got a picture of that? 17 times. Wow. That's how much product. We, we ship out just shy of two truckloads of product a day from our plant in that lumber company. So it was all about taste and it's amazing what taste does. And so, like I said earlier, we've been in business for 50 years and uh, we manufacture it and currently about 175 different sauces, which is, um, which is amazing. Oh, we, um, and that includes the condiments and the jellies. And we make uh, at least 350 combinations of different flavors. So we have a lot of fun doing what we do. Um, just like a mad hatter in a kitchen, we just mix up and see what, what happens. So I'll let you go over this list. This is what we make. And you can see all the products that we do. Um, 
I want you to notice that everything is that, that we make about 35% of our product leaves our plant with other people's labels. And if I tell you who they are, you're not going to be able to leave the room. Um, but we, <laughs> we do private labeling, and that's a big industry in the United States. And it, it gives us a lot of confidence because someone else that has a big brand has confidence in you to make, put your product in under their label. So that's quite a bit. Um, this whole program was scheduled to be done two years ago. And so some of my slides are kind of old. I don't recall these slides anymore. But I was reading a magazine when I, when I was putting this together called The Entrepreneur. And uh, this issue was published in November of 2019. And it basically was telling people, I guess for the first time, what it, what it takes to succeed as a as an entrepreneur, um, there were several things that they wanted you to remember. And number one was the, the way you sell yourself. And um, I used to, you know, I grew up selling peaches. And so uh, the peaches kind of sold themselves. Rexburg had a pretty good reputation for, for peaches. But our, our problem today is that, you know, we can't, how do we sell ourselves? We sell ourselves by being just honest and making the best products that we can. And amazingly, if you do that and people like that, they'll, they'll, they'll sell. Um, the other thing is that we had to do, and that was to find people that will fund us. Usually it's mama in the beginning um, that will help a little bit, but after a while you run out of relatives. And <laughs> you gotta go to friends, you gotta go to family. And if you have to, you go to banks. I hope none of y'all are bankers in here or retired bankers because they're the last people you really want to talk to. <laughs> and I have to tell you that my background is in German and history. I knew nothing about business. I never took business. I never, I did take accounting. I hated accounting. I didn't yeah. understand it. Yeah, I don't know why they required that in liberal arts, but they did. So I, I muddled through like accounting. Um, case, is, case is probably the, the qualified one because he actually took food science at A&M. Um, his wife is a Spanish major, and that comes in handy these days too. And Janie, of course, um, has a PhD uh, in microbiology, so she brought her microscope with her. And that's our combination. So none of us grew up studying food, per se, and getting into, into the relationship. But we, we, we've learned to be really, really good about it. So um, the third thing that they suggest is um, be aware if the product you make doesn't sell. Number one, don't keep making it. it you know, you're going to be... Um, it's going to be oversupplied with a lot of back stock that you don't want. Our, our solution was to make something else, keep trying with new combinations. I guess we're kind of like mad scientists in the laboratory. We just try different flavors. It's not something I grew up with. It's not something that Kate necessarily grew up with, but it's something that, that he, he discovered is, is the interesting part about cooking. The other thing that they recommended is how do you build a customer base? Customers that keep coming back. And of course, if you sell somebody a jar of jelly today, you want them to buy another jar of jelly, uh, or it's not going to be very good when you reach 200 million jars and you've sold a jar to everybody in America. You need them <laughs> to buy more. So um, building a, a customer service, is, I mean, customer base is, is really quite good. And we just believed in being honest. I mean, is there any other way? And then this nice little chapter on beware, success can kill you. So what do you mean by that? Well, it means that you run out of money and then somehow you gotta find um, more money to operate with. It always takes more because if you're selling to customers who are selling to their customers, guess what? You're becoming a bank and you're funding them hopefully for just 30 days Generally, about 90 days to 120 days, and then you pick up the phone and say, "Why aren't you paying me?" So we also learned how to do collections along the way. But those are things that a lot of people probably never really think about, and you can actually grow too fast. And so extending credit is something that really sinks a lot of companies. They've got all their money loaned out, and the banks aren't very patient with you waiting on other people to 
pay you. So running out of money is a, is a real problem. So there were some interesting facts that this magazine listed. I've updated to 22, but it's still good for 2020. And take a look at all these things. It's, it's really amazing. One out of every five new business fail. Everyone, 20% actually survive. You can find it up there. Amazing that two out of three businesses start in a home kitchen, which I guess basically we did too. One out of four pursue a passion, and we are passionate about our product. And so I guess we fit the mold on that. But 95 out of 100 new businesses fail. So if you walk down a supermarket, a supermarket wall, um, aisle and you see a product on there, there are four others that are probably still in production in that year. Everything else is gone. 95 don't make it. It's amazing how many new products are created every year that never wind up on the shelf. Uh, one out of two businesses makes it five years. You can find that up there. One out of three constantly lose money. It's so easy to lose money in business. <laughs> it's amazing. Or you run out of cash, which I mentioned before. Um, one of the worst things to do is ignore your customers. And if you notice up there, one out of five are, are failed to do that. Um, having two founders is better than having one founder. And um, so from 1969, when I opened the roadside market to about 1986, I was one person. And then Case came along and we were two people. And um, I didn't know, I don't remember if we had a third more money at that time but we did grow a lot faster. And so um, there are advantages to having two people in your business. I think you may have one with a cool head. Um, you might look at this. There's why successful, why are, why are some successful entrepreneurs still winding up broke? And it's, it's, um, it's kind of interesting why that would happen. The second one on there is something that really blew me away reading this is to think of financials. Uh, that's the worst thing that you could do. I, I can't believe anybody would do that. So we can never brag about how much money you're making. And we rely at, we were very early to, to hire an accountant that, that did our annual books because we felt it was very important. So that when we went to a bank, when we finally had to go to the bank, we had records that we could produce that were, were accurate. And family businesses are really nice businesses because they succeed. Everything that you hear in the press today about big business and how we're going to tax the heck out of them, just keep in mind that 57% of, of American businesses are family owned. And so it's not the big, big ones on Wall Street and the big manufacturing. This is 57% of all the businesses in the country that they're, that they're targeting. And it's, it's, it's kind of scary when you look at it. Uh, one For one thing, family family partnerships are, are close-knit. They, they kind of believe in each other. Um, they, have, they have better relationships with their vendors. Um, you, you have to believe in your vendor. Your vendor has to believe in you. Um, we, don't, we pay our bills on time. And when you can't pay your bills, we learn to pick up the phone and, and call. And vendors like that, and we've been on both sides of that, so we know the importance of that. Family businesses are also steeped in tradition. Um, my family wasn't in the jam and jelly business. We're actually creating this one. But our employees kind of feel like, like family, and a lot of people have told us that. Plus, we're also very active in the community. So I don't know how many of you own your own businesses, but you know driving the bottom line is difficult. And people have a funny perspective. I have a hard time speaking sometimes have a perspective on what they think you're earning. And you have 90 employees and you're driving a Cadillac with fins and stuff like that, you might get the wrong impression. <laughs> um, but it's really, really interesting what, what they think. And so this article compared Walmart. And take a look at what people think Walmart makes. Net profit, like a 35%. And Look at what Walmart, Walmart really makes. It's kind of kind of frightening uh, when you have statistics like that. Well, um, in our business, and I don't know how many of y'all watch Shark Tank. Shark Tank. 
Yeah. And you ever watch the sharks just laugh and laugh and laugh when somebody's <laughs> netting 5%? They say, what are you doing? And if you're not netting 50% netting, putting in the bank, you just don't know what you're doing. I really wonder sometimes if they really understand business. I'm mean, made billions, so I guess they have. But in the in our, our in our industry, in our manufacturing industry, the net is 2.75%. Two and three quarter cents of every dollar. So we don't put a lot of money in the bank. Well, um, despite all that, despite all the things that the, the magazine said, in, in Gillespie County, we're the fifth largest private employer. And it doesn't take many people to do that. I think currently, currently we're at 90 employees. Uh, I think Jenny's trying to grow that to 100. Uh, we're just, you know, pretty well busting at the seams, but how many of y'all been to the cooking school at the Peach House? The cooking school. Okay, if you were in a cooking classroom, that used to be that used to be our kitchen. It was half that size, and we had 14 people in that room Whoa. moving around the pots at one time. So how did we get started? Well, all of us have to grow somewhere. And guess which one's me? <laughs> Well, the last time I could win a contest, I think. I was, um, this is 1944, I was three years old. This is the only family photograph my father ever had made. And he was, there was a reason for it. If you see my brother in a uniform, that's Jenny's dad. Um, this is 1944. Um, his entire class had just been drafted by the Army. The junior senior class a and was taken into the Army in active duty. And I'm pretty sure he was scheduled to be part of the invasion of Japan. And I think my dad was worried. And so he had this family photograph taken. The funny thing about this photograph is I can remember the instant this photograph was taken. I remember exactly asking my mom if I could put my arm on that armrest of hers. Everybody else is standing at attention. So it's amazing that some things you never forget. I'm gonna show you this. Um, you might call this a farm. We never really grew up calling it a farm. This is the 60 acres. This is the house in which I was born. And this is the house that's still on the, the site. Um, I'm gonna come back to it because there's certain things I wanna point out to you. And the larger 60 acres looks something like this. This photograph was taken many, many years ago. And you can see the original orchard that my dad planted in 1928. And uh, I actually grew up in the, in the 50s still picking peaches from those trees. They were old, they were decrepit. As you know, peach trees don't live forever. At about 14 years, it's time to put in a new tree. They just fall apart just like, like we do. Um, I was introduced to jams and jellies by being called to the back steps of our house. My mother would be um, cooking jams and jellies and then she'd call to see if I would want to lick out the pot. Well, that, grew, that grew to be my, my best passion, gosh, to have a spoon and scrape out all the crusted jams and jellies. I don't know how many times I burned my tongue, um, but I enjoyed doing that. This is about the time I entered junior high. Everybody else you saw in that photograph was gone. Not my mom, not my pop, but all my sisters. They, they got to go to school when they were five. Um, my brother and older sister just went through 11 grades. Three of my sisters graduated from college at 19. Two of them had masters at the age of 20. At 18, I'm still sitting in high school. Either I was really severely retarded or um, <laughs> I didn't really want to advance me, but <laughs> Sometime in the 50s, I started getting woke up. There was nobody else home, and I was told to put on long sleeve shirts and button them up to here because I had to help my mother pick peaches. And I really didn't realize at the time that my father had planted all those peach trees, but uh, we did have an orchard that was old and decrepit, uh, but was still producing fantastic peaches. They were all one flavor, so they all came right at one time. And my parents being German and my father being born in Germany. And the reason you had a wife in those days is to cook up all the surplus stuff that those trees produced. So she was busy canning a lot of stuff. My dad had gone to a meeting that interested him in 1926. There was a, there were big headlines on, in the newspaper calling for all cotton growers to show up. And in those days, the paper would run what called a mass meeting in big block letters. And they were calling all the cotton growers because the people who were loaning them money wanted to talk to them. 
Number one, it was 1928. The war was over in 1918, and some of them had paid, hadn't paid their bill. And I know some of y'all eat over at Werner Warehouse. Remember Farmer's Grain Warehouse? Well, be, there used to be a lot of warehouses like that in town, and those warehouses acted like banks to the farmers. So you went to the warehouse and you bought your groceries. We're in a warehouse, you used to have a grocery. So you could buy all your groceries and you could buy all your feed, you could buy all your fertilizer and all your seed. And then when you harvested the crop, you sold it to them because they bought it and then they resold it. That's how they make money as well. Well, if you don't start paying your bill on a charge account like that, guess what? They were getting kind of concerned. So in 1926, they decided to meet in the courthouse and 450 cotton growers showed up. And the merchants, not the bankers, because the bankers were smart enough to secure the property with, with what they were giving you. So the bankers weren't there, but the merchants were. And uh, they wanted an explanation and said, why, why is this 1926? What are you going to do in 27 to pay your bill? Tell us. And um, they looked at, imagine the old library, the, the current library, the second floor with 450 cotton growers on air condition. They're all packed in there. My dad decided he would attend and just to see what this is all about. And if you ever go to meetings and you spread your hand and say something, you know, sometimes you wish you hadn't. He was elected secretary, and so he, uh, he had to take notes. And then when they were ending the meeting, they asked the new officers to tell them, well, all right, tell us how you're going to pay back some of your bill next year. And so the president got up of the new um, cotton of the new, you know, new cotton growers and said, well, you know, next year, uh, I'm not going to plant so much cotton. I'm going to have some white sheep, sheep on my farm. I'm going to have some white chickens. So I kind of ready to live like a cotton farm. Believe me, he said that. It's all in the paper. I couldn't believe it when I was doing the research. When I got down to my dad, and my dad got down and said, well, maybe some of you guys should start thinking about planting something else, like fruit trees could grow here. He grew up in an area of Germany um, um, where Lake Konstanz is a glacial lake that separates uh, part of Germany from Switzerland, so it's really, really pretty. And they grow a lot of grapes there. They grow peaches and plums and apricots. And he grew up seven miles just to the north of it. And so he thought fruit would be a good thing to grow. Well, you should know when you stick your tongue out like that and you say something like that, you better put up or shut up. So then he bought the 60 acres and uh, he started planting peach trees. Now, by 1935, the paper was already beginning to pick up on peaches as a crop in Fredericksburg. And the reason for that is they, they were really working. There were 31 growers, I think, uh, by this time growing peaches, but they had no place to sell them. Number one, we had no paved highways yet, so it was a little difficult for people to hop in their car and drive to Fredericksburg to get a bushel of peaches because you didn't know how many flat tires you were going to have in those days. <laughs> the roads weren't paved, and it was, you know, it was like a week's adventure. Well, not that long. But all these people were bringing their pickups and their peaches to Main Street. They were, in the old days, they used to back up into a slot and then open up business out of the back of their, their pickup. And the paper was getting kind of concerned about it. The city was getting kind of concerned about it. And the Chamber of Commerce was getting kind of concerned about it. It's okay, you guys, you ever heard of advertising? I mean, we need to get the word out that Fredericksburg has peaches. So this is how everything got started. Well. Ten years later, um, <laughs> these were the instruments that my mom and mom, mom, my mom and me used to harvest peaches. My dad had no pickup. He had no tractor. He had he had no trailer. We had to walk everything out of the orchard. He never sprayed. He never pruned. He never trimmed anything on his peach trees. They could grow like shrubs. That was fine with him. He had a funny philosophy about about animals and plants and kids. He just thought they knew what to do and <laughs> don't interfere with them. And um, I don't know how many of y'all ever watched the Ace Reed or saw the Ace Reed cartoons. A uh, guy lived in Kerrville and he used to, I don't know, kind of Western magazines. He would have an Ace Reed cartoon. There'd always be two cow pokes on the, on the ranch and it was dry as a bone and there were skulls everywhere and there were dead cows. And that was our farm. It was just like that. Um, my dad never called the best. I mean, if you got sick, it was your fault. If we got sick, it was our fault. If I stepped in the mail, I didn't say anything because I got a whipping. And so um, we had to walk everything out of the orchards. And so 
The bushel basket, as you might know, holds 48 pounds of peaches. My mom could carry and I could carry that between us. And then we had a bucket or another basket. And we, I don't know if you were, heard the word German word schlepped. You yeah. schlepped everything out of the orchard. So we made a lot of trips. Um, in 1950, my dad did buy a tractor. It was way too late by that time, but he bought a little farm all tractor that was kind of neat. He also bought a pickup. I had no idea what possessed him to do that, except I think he was foreclosing on a loan. And that was not the kind of pain in fact. So I'm back to this place. And you can see all the, the apple trees. Um, we had probably 100 apple trees. The orchard is off. I don't think my pointer works. I can see if I can try it. They said it wouldn't work. Uh, on the there it is. It's on the wall. Yeah, if you can follow that, but I'm trying to get up here. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why that works great on my office and things, but um, we did still have 400 off bird or peaches that ripened and lots of apple trees. And you can see the washing on the line and that water tank. That was, that was the wash house. Uh, we had our own well, and my mom washed all the clothes outside. Well, that's where we brought all the peaches in, under the shade of the hackberry trees, and I watched her sort them out and get them ready. And then um, somebody would drive in and say, you got any peaches for sale? No. Deborah could figure out how they knew we had peaches. <laughs> and then on the side over here, you see that cement fence. My dad built that. That becomes kind of important to me later on um, as I'm it, it get put in charge of selling them. I used to carry them to the front and I would tilt them on the curbing of that and I'd sit there all day until we until I'd sell all my peaches and and that was my summer. I always thought it'd be nice. One day my mother asked me, why don't you paint a sign? You're a little artistic and I could barely spell. But um, I said, okay, uh, this is what I would have liked to create it. Even if I've done something like that, that would have been nice. What I came up with was something like this. <laughs> but to my amazement, I hammered that on the telephone yeah. post and it worked. I mean, people were pulling in to the back. And so then I you know, started the moving out front. And I'm sitting out front, I said, you know, it would really, really be nice if I had a really neat place on the front. And I don't know if you know, I'm going to kind of talk to you about the the dust bowl later on. You know where the dust bowl was? You know where it ended up? It was here. Here. <laughs> All that sand got deposited here. And on the north side of our house, the, the fence was buried. And it was a little higher than everything else. And I said, I would like to put a stand up there. And if I could do something like this, this would be great. Even if I could have come up with something like this, that would have been neat. I mean, that is so clean. That would work today. Self-service, I wouldn't have to sit there. What I came up with looked more like that, <laughs> but it worked. And one day I took in $85. Now this is 1955. That was a lot of money. I gave every penny to my mom. I never got paid a nickel. Uh, I was glad I got a new pair of blue jeans every year. But uh, she kept all the money and I said, wow, I love this. I mean, this is working great. So there were several things that happened to me in my life that kind of laid the foundation which sometimes I didn't know at the time, certainly would not have known at the time, but do kind of have an influence. And in 1957, my dad bought a 53 used Chevrolet station wagon. And it was, it was neat. And um, my sister came home, my older sister, and said, we're gonna go to California. And so my mother asked one of her best friends, and, and so we drove out to California. My dad refused to go. And so you can imagine what it was like driving in the 50s. Um, I had sent off to, in those days, you could send off to Exxon. It wasn't Exxon, it was Mobile or Hummel. And they would send you a map. You tell them where you want to go, and they would route you through whatever you want to see. So that was highlighted. And so I had done all that. And I don't know, I don't remember who recommended Knott's Berry Farm. How many of y'all heard of Knott's Berry Farm? It's still there. It's still there. there. That year. Yeah. That year? Yeah. You remember that? I probably met you. Um, <laughs> we had a station wagon too. <laughs> I remember that station wagon. It belonged to two wrestlers in San Antonio. And it had an electronic eye in the front. You ever seen those on, on dashes? They would dim the lights for you automatically. 
and you'd be fun to put your hand in front of that so that I couldn't see it and you just blind somebody. <laughs> um, that's what we drove and we went to not to we went to Knott's Berry Farm. It's a fabulous place. I fell in love with this place. We ate chicken there, of course, which is famous. Um, you could pan for gold. They had a Western village. They had a steam engine that ran out on the track. They had a park. They had everything for kids. It was wonderful. I was in Hog Heaven again. And um, of course, they made the best jellies in the world. And they were good jellies until Smuckers bought them. And then Smuckers took out all the sugar and put in corn syrup. I have any patience. Well, we came back from that and back on the farm. And I said, okay, my mom's away. I have to cook supper for my dad. It'd be a good time to tell him about that $85 day I had. <laughs> I want to be a peach farmer. And my dad, you saw what my dad looked like. He usually wore his glasses up here. And he could just raise his eyebrows and those glasses fell down and his ears went back. And I knew I was in for a lecture of my life. Because he ran away from home at the age of 12. They sacrificed everything to send all the kids to college. Education was everything. And I imagine it was heresy for me to say, I want to be a peach farmer <laughs> or grower. I just love the idea of selling. That's what I did. So anyway, I got shipped off to Texas A&M. My dad died at the beginning of my sophomore year. And I thought it'd be a nice time to become a lawyer. My brother was a lawyer and they were, my dad and my brother were in business together. And I knew how, how proud my, my dad was to work in a law practice with his son because all his contemporaries who were lawyers didn't get along with their sons. And so there was never anything else. Anyway, there was Weezer and Weezer. And um, anyway, um, I was creating doodling all the time. What's my stand going to look like if I ever get around to having a stand someday? And so I'm thinking about going to law school. I graduate from A&M barely. Um, and I go to the University of Texas Law School. And for the first time, we have television. We can have TV at a and I mean, one, one set in the, the dorm, and it was always a senior privilege to change channels if you got into the lounge, and it all, you know, how they used to run like this all the time. So I never watched TV, but on Sunday evenings, this stranger came on, and we started watching um, Julia Child, a remarkable, she had such a neat technique of teaching. It was unbelievable. She was, she was breaking all the molds on, on cooking classes, but that kind of was another step that that interested me and I didn't know it at the time. In the summer of 64, we, we spent in Europe at my older sister, next older sister and my mom and me decided to go to Europe for two months. Wow, um, that, you know, flights were cheap in those days. I wanted to meet my dad's sister. I had never met my aunt. And so we were on the way to, to see her uh, near that lake I was telling you about. But we also take in Paris and London and different places. And we get to a nice restaurant and we start ordering this beef tartare. And I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, I paid 20 bucks for this. <laughs> this is what we used to eat when we had made sausage. And my uncle would, would take some of the sausage fillings after we got through and crack a couple of eggs into it, take a handful of post toasties and mix in there and put together. And then my mom and dad sat around the table drinking beer with, with my aunt and uncle. I said, that's beef tartare. I love this stuff. You ever had beef tartare? Oh, I could eat a steak raw with mm -hmm. my came along and said, why cook this stuff? It's really great. The other thing we did, we went to Switzerland, we had fondue. How many of y'all ever had fondue? Oh, <laughs> Thank you, because we probably introduced fondue to the Americans. We've each bought fondue pots fondue is you cook your meal at a table. There were four of us, we had plates like this, we had drank four bottles of wine for lunch, it's the best meal I ever remember. Uh, <laughs> it was really great, we had seven sauces, and uh, the, making putting a sauce on, on meat, that was, you know, ketchup is one thing, but, <laughs> but sauces, it was incredible. So there was another thing that happened. Well, um, I wanted to raise peaches, and I got a, teach, a job teaching in Seguin, I think I was earning $450 a month beginning salary in those days. And so I took my first paycheck and I bought trees and I started replanting the orchards. And you can see this is, this wasn't the original. I don't have original photographs. 
but I would drive back and forth from Seguin every weekend for the next nine years. I drove, if you put them all together in nine years, I could have reached the moon. Some people think I should have kept going. Um, <laughs> but I wanted, I wanted an orchard. And at the time we were growing all these things. Uh, we had peaches, we had pears, we had plums. Uh, my mom made jellies out of what's called a Mexican plum. I don't know whether we still call them that anymore, but that's the only name I know. Uh, they're wonderful plums. They're a little bitter. They really make great jams and jellies. My dad um, would make wine, and he actually had Concord grapes, and he had Chipanero, and he had the black Spanish grapes. So, and plus, we had the Mustang grapes. So we made jellies out of And I actually grew those apples up there. Um, I think we can, you can grow apples here. We're trying it again. Uh, I shouldn't have taken out all the trees that my daddy had planted, but remember I told you he just thought a tree could do what it wanted to, and so they were just growing all different ways, and I was trying to shape them into a tree, and I either killed half of them or finally said, you're just too embarrassing to leave on the spot, and I, I took them out. Well, I bought my first tractor. This was a Farmall Super C. Oh, I love that tractor. And I had to buy a plow, and of course, hydraulic systems didn't really come with tractors in those days, or at least not the ones I could afford. And so we had a drag plow. I, I did install my first uh, irrigation system on peaches, not with drip, but with sprinkler system. And I would move all those pipes, and I watered the heck out of this orchard. Man, I got growth on trees. It was unbelievable. I watered, I watered them so much, I had to walk in the orchard barefooted because I sank down to the clay level. Uh, moving the pipes every day, but I wanted I wanted to do things right. I eventually bought a sprayer, the John Dean sprayer. I love that sprayer. That was so much fun. Um, it's really really great. Grew nice peaches in those days, and there's nothing that beats a tree ripe and peach. But I told you about the dust bowl, and our orchard was lots of sand, and that that tractor never hit clay. Um, if you weren't careful turning a roll. If you turn too sharply, you just started going down. And so you had to make sure that at the end of the road, you kind of swept in large arcs and didn't try to come back to the next row. So I had I dumped that out. I learned my lesson, but I had dug it out several times. So um, in 67, I began to think about my stand. I had my little drawings. I didn't know what it was going to look like. Who knows what? It, nobody knew what it was going to look like. I didn't even have an idea. But a friend of mine said, you know, so-and-so out there is tearing down a log cabin. Why don't you see if you'll sell it? And so I went out to visit this gentleman. I won't tell you who it is. And yeah, he was tearing down this beautiful log cabin that had been built in 1870. And I said, I said, for sale? And he said, yeah, <laughs> you could see a sucker. Um, and uh, I said, how much you want it? He said, ah, I've got to have $150 for this. I said, good, I'll buy it. And I want all the rocks too. And he said, oh, those are $10 more. <laughs> so, I spent the summer of 67 loading up, the, taking the rest of the cabin down and taking these logs that I just treasured. I had blueprints, I measured everything. I knew what it was going to look. I fell in love with log cabins. <laughs> I actually started buying and selling log cabins on the side. But I hauled this one in town. My mom said, well, did you pay for that? And I told her. And she said, well, son, you just threw away $150. So I didn't tell her about the rocks. <laughs> <laughs> in the spring of 69, I started, I hired a, a carpenter to put it back together. This is, this is March. And I, I fell in love with this. I took hundreds of slides. I had a Kodak, I had a Kodak slide, 35 millimeter, which was the rage. I took, I took so many photographs. I couldn't, I could just, I couldn't think about getting home in time to see what progress had been made each week. But I, I took, I took hundreds of photographs. I know every inch of this cabin. I loved it. It was built in the 1870s. A family named Koenig had, um, had built it. And, uh, Cabins like this were built with uh, a trellis attached to them. So it, it, was, it looked like a solid rock house. And what they did, they took cane pole and split it and then made a trellis. And then they plastered it with cement or plaster. So it looked like a solid rock house. It was embarrassing to have a rock wall, a, a log house. So they wanted it to look like stone. Anyway, I found where they, somebody had chiseled an arrow and a skull and a crossbone. I don't know if that was a omen for me, but it's still there. I can find it somewhere. Anyway, um, I love 
photographing this thing each week with something new. I redesigned the top. Um, I wanted it. I wanted it that kind of uh, peak inside. But I had a little loft up there. You could sleep up there. I did. I just love this cabin. Everybody else in town didn't pay much attention to it. I never got any press out of this at all. But um, this is opening day um, in June 1969, and I should have learned an important lesson I learned 15 years earlier. It's called display. And I had gotten up early. I had a Model T in those days. I was going to do the peach jamboree. And so I'm driving. I set my mom up with peaches inside, little baskets, and everything ready to go, everything priced. And I drove to Stonewall and won a blue ribbon. And I came back a little after lunch. And I parked the car. And I go inside. And she just burst in tears. I said, what's wrong? So I haven't sold anything. <laughs> I'm thinking, oh my god, have I made a mistake? So I said, all right, let's put all the peaches on the porch. So we put them all on the porch. This one, guess what? This one sells. I sold out by five o'clock. So I had learned, relearned an important lesson. On the years where I go on, I take a lot of photographs. They're not important to anybody, but um, I enjoyed doing them. Um, this was years later in the 70s. Even when the rainbow came out, I took pictures. Can you see the rainbow? I thought it was just neat. This was like my own baby. I even painted it. and. Uh, I like I like painting and so I did that. Did have I even Radio Post came out and took a picture in the 70s. And so that's what it looked like then. I was um, I even designed my own rubber stamp for canceling checks. I didn't get many checks, but some you know we would take check. Taking a check was a big deal. You know, people were like, when you take a check, you know, I'm glad I'm from out of town. Um, it was bad that when you were sunk with it, um, it's not like today. But I designed my own little rubber stamp. Uh, still have it so I could cancel my checks. I, was, I had a lot of crazy ideas. I had this made in Salzburg. It's still on the cabin. Uh, I bought a cash register from a neighbor, a 1912 uh, National, really beautiful. Um, I took the, far, took the telephone from our farm and put it inside, ran two wires to our home in the house. I could call my mom by ringing on the line. And y'all grew up with a phone like that. Mm -hmm. Everybody had a ring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Our, our, number, our, our number was 1313, which meant one long ring and three shorts. And so you were a party line. And you could answer the phone and you could listen to say who else was also clicking the receiver and listen. Yeah. Yeah. That was the way it was. I also decided to make a little shelf for my mom's jellies because when I opened, I wanted jellies to sell. And I had to convince her not to make them into pints because, you know, all Germans want to do big bottles. And then I want the little half pints. And so I even designed my label. Um, we used to have two newspapers. One of them was the Radio Post and run by Freddy Deedle. I think Dean Deedle just closed his shop, his print shop. So that's kind of sad to see them go. But I, I drew that with ink, uh, India ink and made my label. Notice there's no brand, but this is the print shop. But I mean, I put that. <clears throat> My mom kept records on whatever little notebook she had, bridge pads, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> I bought all the ingredients and, uh, and paid her so much a jar. Um, I created all of these little labels. We kind of made a bigger jar for apple butter, um, grew a little better house. Still don't have a name or a brand, just Dust Peach House. And um, my favorite preserves that I had my mom make that first year was green grape. Anybody ever had that? No. That's my favorite preserves all the time. That's how we harvest the grapes. They're green, they're about this big size of peas. They can have no seed. If you crunch on the seed, it, they're, too far, they're too far gone. It takes about two hours to cook that, but it turns a beautiful golden color. Um, I don't know it's just black almost. That, 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 that's just fantastic stuff. My, my, my sister, well, this is Jenny's mom. Um, Grew up with strawberries. We never ate strawberries. That was a foreign food to us. And so she, she made my strawberry jelly for me. She lived next door and uh, she was fun to work with. And my mother thought strawberry preserves was crazy, but it began to sell and more people like strawberry. Um, in the 70s, they even had uh, Southern Living magazine came by and took a picture of me building the fence out front. And that was the end of that. Never had anything else with that. But also in the 70s, I had a chance to buy another building. So not only am I buying and selling all cabins on the side, this, all, this building was offered to me. And um, that is the Lone Star Brewery warehouse. 
and it stood on, ironically where we are now in town manufacturing. Um, and I moved it and brought it out. And my mother was really, <clears throat> my mother wasn't upset with me buying that. I paid, paid $4,000 for it, uh, moved and then set on site with a new roof. It cost me $7,000. I was deeper in debt, but I had a neat warehouse and she loved it because she used to be the accountant and in that, about it, not when it was Lone Star Brewery, but when it, you know, prohibition hit and all the beer industry was gone. And, and there was a uh, uh, wholesale grocery Collins company that was renting it. She was the bookkeeper for Collins. So she never said another word about me buying investments and buying a lot of buildings. Um, it, we didn't do the best job at decorating it. Um, kind of makes me realize that when a banker asked us where we were located and we said, you know, the peach house, and said, you mean those shacks out there? <laughs> and uh, said, yeah, this is the bicentennial. So we hadn't made much progress by the time the United States was settling that. I took a lot of photographs of the peach house any time of year I'm out there taking pictures. Um, I, of course, I love the building. Um, a lot of people take pictures today of it. I had a friend that painted me these signs, uh, which I still have. It was so, it's kind of amazing that when you do things that are unique, you find unique people that come in and kind of support you. When your own family says you're crazy, and <laughs> someone else says, I don't know, it's kind of neat. So, I, as I said, I taught school for nine years and drove back and forth and just had weekends. In the summers, I was busy selling teachers. So, I finally decided to quit. Can't couldn't get a job in Fredericksburg. I'm just going to quit. Well, everybody in my family had a conniption. You know what a conniption is? Um, <laughs> they were really upset. But not having a job gave me a lot of free time because peaches are just June, July, and August. So, what are you going to do the rest of the year? Well, in January, I had heard about this roadside conference. And it was a Dr. Cravens of Ohio State that had a conference for roadside marketeers. And I said, I want to go to that. So I, I flew up to the state in Ohio. And um, it was just fascinating because not only were you sitting in a conference room listening to, to guys tell you how to do a better presentation on your farm, how to get people to your farm, how to do marketing. There were people outside selling stuff, like, like the vendors. And I ran into a, a company called Lost Acres, and they had this beautiful little square jar. And I thought, that's really, really neat. Will you sell me the glass? And they said, yeah, right. Only if you buy our mustard. And I said, okay. So I started buying their mustard wholesale and selling that. And they would sell me glass. And so what I did is we started making uh, jellies in these small little five and a half ounce jars. They were just, it was just called a square mason. It was really, really neat. And so we had a good thing going. <clears throat> I'm going to jump way ahead because we got to a point where they called us and said, um, we can't sell to you anymore. We've just, we've just been bought up by Smuckers. And Smuckers was asking, who are these people in Texas you're selling to? And I went, oh gosh, we, can't, we buy thousands of these jars. I said, will you give me one year? Will you give us one year to continue selling glass? And they said, no, we'll do that. So what we did is we found actually my, my brother-in-law and my sister chipped in the money to pay to build a mole in China. <laughs> We're manufacturing container loads of glass in China and bringing them into LA. And but we used a truckload of engineer anyway. We, this was a big seller for us. And so um, that that was pretty good. I had my supply. <laughs> One day we get a call from LA and they're saying, um, we have some people that want to buy this glass. Is it okay if we sell them to them? And we said, well, who is it? And they said, Smuckers. Um, <laughs> so we said, absolutely, but don't tell them who we are. So we were selling a truckload of glass a month to Smuckers at $5,000 a pop. <laughs> well, Smuckers got smart, and we had improved the jar. Um, the, their, their jar didn't have a ring on the bottom. And so when you tried to stack them, they kind of slid off. We put a ring on the bottom and it was stackable. And I guess they liked that idea, but they got bored with that too. And they started getting their own mold in, in Mexico. 
So for a while, we had a blast selling glass pipes and smokers. Well, um, I was open, open only in the summer. So we had June, July, and August to really sell because Frankensburg was kind of strange in those days. This was pre-tourist days. I depended on tourists. Main Street was dead. There was nothing on Main Street. And when I moved back to Frankensburg, actually before I moved back to Frankensburg, I used to attend meetings of the Frankensburg Heritage Federation and get in my, there was a, a lady at the Radio Post, Ernest Diedel Heinen, that wanted me involved in, in, in things. So we, we started doing wild game dinners and when I, came back to, to live here that was very active in, in, the, in those organizations trying to promote tourism to get something started because we didn't really have a lot. And uh, it, it was, took us a long time to make Main Street shoppable. And I'll get back to that in a minute too. But, but I used to sell, uh, I had a lady in Fernie that would make a hundred bonnets for me and I'd hang them up like a wash, cloth, wash line out in front of the store. I sold at least 4,000 dollars worth of sinsaware every summer. And I tried on the way to go to Mexico and bring all this enamelware back. I had a blast doing that. People seemed to like it. And I was trying to create a general store. My sister-in-law's mother made all those hanging baskets and she would make beautiful hang, we'd hang them out. It was really gorgeous. I was also looking for new products. And one of the things that, that caught my eye was wahia honey. You ever had that? It, you have to harvest it soon. You have to bring it back and it's almost white. It's, it's not colored. And so I was looking for unusual products. So white and honey was one of those things that I did. And our chili sales are going up and it finally got time where I needed a bigger kitchen than my mom's. And so um, once again, I needed to go to family. This time I went to my sister and says, you know, I'll give you half the one and a half acres I bought the peach house log cabin. I'll give you a 50% partnership if, if you'll help loan money to, the, to our new company and, and build a kitchen. And this is my, this is my sister, uh, Jeanette. And she was, I think, 15 years older than I was. In many ways, she was my mother growing up. And she was a college professor. She taught for the last 27 years at Sam Houston State University in, in Huntsville. Uh, she was gregarious. She was fun to be around. Uh, my mother loved her and she loved my mother. And so it was great to be home for half the summer. But, you know, sometimes it gets to be too long and then you got to go. And, but they always had great reunions. Anyway, she funded constructions. And uh, if you look at that, um, <clears throat> that's actually our cooking school. That, that's what that's open. So uh, we, we added that and, and built that on and then mm -hmm. put a kitchen in the log cabin. And um, Jeanette started cooking things for me and she kept notes just like my mother did. I still have all those. Um, to see what that, well, that's Jeanette's recipes. We, um, it's, it's funny how one gets driven into certain things that we do today. And this is like eating the fondue and discovering all those sauces. But we started experimenting with, with recipes. So let's do recipe cards. This is my mom's wine sauce. And so we did a series of little recipe cards like this. And we tried to wholesale them. The only person that would carry them was Hector Petrogon over at the peach tree. And um, he didn't pay up front. He only paid on what he sold. So it's kind of neat. It's called consignment. We even did a catalog sheet, a mail order. And we discovered something about, about mail order. Mail order, you know, if you get a 1% return, you're really considered good. So we licked a lot of stamps and put a lot of money into that and never did it again. It just, <laughs> just wasn't the thing to do. About this time, my aunt uh, lost her husband and was starting to come down to Kerrville to visit her brother. And uh, she introduced us to peach honey. You ever had peach honey? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> peach honey is made with just sugar and peaches. So you get the ripest peaches you can. And she come to the store and said, these peaches are just ripe for peach honey. And she wrote out the recipe and left it with us as she's heading back to Waco. The next year she came back and said, you done any peach honey? And I said, no, haven't gotten around to it. So she grabbed some peaches, she went to the kitchen and she cooked up um, a batch of peach honey, brought them back to the store. And being the person who she is, she just said, well, had, had 
It's all nice jars that were nice and warm. Everybody came in the store here, try this. And everybody that tried it bought a jar. And so we're kind of really stupid. So that that is selling that well, we're starting making peach honey. So this became a big seller for us. And so I had to throw it in here because that's how it came about. And then this young little shaper shows up. Um, around 1979, uh, I, I, was, I was basically broke. I had planted 10,000 peach, peaches out on the farm. I grew them for three years, and then we had three years of killing frost. And you, know, you finally run out of money. I said, maybe this is not the business I need to be in with. So I was looking for a job, and Fredericksburg High School called uh, a week before school started and said, you want a job? You have nobody else left to hire. And so I, I started teaching at, at the high school here. And uh, I think I told you earlier, I, I, I love teaching. I really miss the kids. I taught a total of 15 years. But this is, these are the kind of kids you run into. And Case was in my, Case was trying out for tennis. I was a tennis coach at the time. And I needed someone to thrash agaritas. You ever heard of agaritas? Yep. Now they have little leaves like holly and they ripen in early spring. And so I said, Case, I, I'll, I'll pay you to work at the store and let's go thrash agaritas. This is actually Case's first day at work. And I didn't find out what he was thinking until just a couple of months ago. And he was thinking, what is that old man gonna do with all these berries? I wanna see all of these jellies he's gonna make. But what we made was agarita jelly. And this was a big seller. Uh, I don't even know if it's still in production, but this was huge. I mean, we sold a ton of this stuff. <clears throat> so Case goes to work for me at the store. Um, actually, he just kind of moves in. Um, some days I say, Case, you're not supposed to work. I can't afford to pay you. So I'm, I don't care. I want to be here. He lives just a quarter mile down the road. So Case was there all the time. And my sister in law fell in love with Case. Um, they got along great. She always bragged this was the son she never had, which kind of was puzzling because she did have a son. And I don't know where that left him, but uh, they got along great. They loved each other. And um, he, he tells a story which is not true. He went down and talked to my sister and says, you know, he hasn't paid me yet. Well, you just tell him to pay you. <laughs> they did a lot of free hours that he did. So we had a lot of fun. And unfortunately, I, was, I wanted to follow my dad in footsteps of becoming county judge because I had a lot of ideas about uh, tourism and making the county more accessible and it's all crazy ideas because county judge has nothing to do with that but I was trying and so that was happening in 82 and in 83 my mom passed away in, in March and my mom and my sister used to sit on the front porch and they had a great time at least for the first or second six weeks of summer um, and my sister said, I, I don't want to come home anymore. It's not the same. And so she really had lost interest. She was still still involved and all that, but she didn't, she didn't want to work anymore. And so um, May comes along and Gus is about ready to graduate. And Case and I had developed a great relationship. We've spent many, many hours talking to each other. Um, I guess I became a father figure to him. We talked about everything. I consulted about everything. Sometimes he'd ask direction. I'd give him direction, and I could never get a commitment out of him. But weeks later, I'd see him do exactly what I told him to do. So I knew I was getting through somewhere along the line. But he came to my office one afternoon, and I let you can read it in his, his own words that he wrote there at the bottom. And basically, he just came to my office. I knew, I still know exactly where he was standing, where I was standing at my desk. And he said, I think we can do something with these gems and jellies. And um, I remember that conversation where I sat across from my table at my father, across the table from my father, and said, I want to be a peach grower. And I didn't say a word. I said, OK, let's go to college first. You know, we've got four years to go. So Case went off to A&M, and he had a great time. He joined the BGs. Um, a and M was a blast. It was, you know, it was college, and I'm beginning to think, well, we need to figure out how to start marketing uh, jellies. And the only thing I can think of is to put on my consignment because there was nobody that would buy our jellies. So we were selling our jellies only at the store. But for me to go to the Peach Street and say, Hey, Hector, will you buy my jellies? Mm -hmm. Nobody would pay up front. So we had to go to consignment. 
Well, the peach tree never carried them, but I built these displays in the, in my barn and I figured out how many jars could sit on there. And then I went to Burke's Barbecue. Remember Burke's Barbecue? How about Deep's Bakery? Burke's Burke's Bakery? Yes. And show his antiques. Yeah. And I said, look, can I put this display in yeah. your store? And I'll load it with jellies. And then you just pay me for what's, what sells. And so nobody bought our jellies, but I started putting these displays up. And um, that worked great. Uh, over the years, I had met, had a chance to meet a lot of really interesting people. One of them was the guy that owned Handy Andy, actually, it was Charles Becker, who was also mayor of San Antonio. And he used to drive up in his Ferrari every Sunday and it's a splashy wife. And we we talk for hours, but just, he was just a great guy. And so he let me put, him, put these uh, stands in, in Handy Andy as well. And so I had to go to San Antonio every two weeks and count all the jellies and restock them and send them bills. And so that kind of worked. The other food store that we were able to get into was Penn Foods. That doesn't exist anymore. But it was probably the first kind of whole food store in San Antonio. They were getting the more exotic flavors. And I don't know what happened to Penn's, but I had, had a little displays there. We finally redesigned the label. And Case and I talked about this a lot. And I said, OK, we're going to incorporate uh, as Fisher and Weezer. And everybody in my family had a connection. So why is it Weezer first? I said, well, Weezer and Fisher just don't touch it. <laughs> and so um, they were upset about that, but I liked it better. And I guess Case liked it. He ever complained. Um, but this is, the, this is the label that we created. And I wish I still had that artwork that somebody came by and, and did for us. And so um, cases where you can just see the jelly kitchen on the corner over here, which had a pointer now, that lean to that got added to the log cabin, that became the jelly kitchen that we were using at the time. Uh, we eventually outgrew that and built a new one in the back of the, the bigger store. Um, we had, Case was trying to come up with flavors. I mean, he had majored in food science and he had, he actually, at a and we have a term called frogging into something. You ever heard that term? When you jump into something beyond your level. Case I was able to frog into, into a master's course in food science at a and So he was, he was already in food science with graduates. And food science is where you learn all about food, obviously. And the project that he had for that year that just blew everybody away was creating a maraschino jalapeno. And I'm still tasting today. Making maraschino cherries, you have to pump all the color out of the cherries. You have to pump, um, what is it? You pump through them, lye. You pump lye through them, you bleach them, and you pump fresh water and get all that out. And then you pump the color back in and the sugar, and you're going to maraschino cherry, you put a stem in it. He did that with a jalapeno. And they were absolutely stunning. and. Um, was great. It impressed the prom. Um, we were still kind of thinking of, of basic things like, how about a jalapeno jelly? Now, I know you know about jalapeno jelly today, but back then, people, we had sample bars. People came in and would kind of almost graze and you're at the bar. They would just eat everything and they put a teaspoon, a teaspoon of jalapeno jelly in their mouth and it would turn different colors. And when they got their breath back, they were kind of screaming, up, what are you trying to do to us? I mean, whoa, who ever heard of putting jalapeno in this? And so and we had said, well, you know, you know, explore your options a little bit. Jalapeno jelly is, was, was kind of interesting. So, you know, why don't you put it over, fill it up for cream cheese? Yeah. You know, you could, um, just spread it over the top, you tear open the jar, whisk it up, make a sauce out of it and pour it over the top, put crackers around it, and you got an instant hors d'oeuvre. And people would go, oh, hmm, that's a good idea. Um, we actually named this the National Hors d'oeuvre of Texas. And we did it and we did it every day in the store. So people, instead of eating the jelly, they did the cream cheese and it started to sell like crazy. The other flavor we did was the 1015 onion. Um, I had the, the 1015 onion. You know who invented that? <laughs> Any idea? Ever heard of Texas A&M? Yeah. Oh, oh in the state, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but you know who takes all the credit? But Daniel Georgia. 
So then a and actually developed this in 1928. And when I was taking horticulture classes at A&M, we would plant in the fruit trees, we would plant trees that were got shipped into AM to be put into the into sometimes we dug a hole four by four, two feet deep in black dirt, like <clears> deep <throat> black dirt, but we put fertilizer and some, we put all this stuff and others, and they would grow them for 20 years to see what kind of result. If a peach graduated to market, it got a new name. And so um, when they planted the onion, the 1015 means it's planted October 15th. And what AM decided to do with this onion, having created the Vidalia onion, and I'll tell you more about them in a second, they said, we're just going to call it 1015. It gets planted October 15th. There was a big white sweet onion, and it was released. I said, okay, so let's take the 1015 onion jelly and let's make a 1015 onion jelly, um, jelly out of it. And we did the same thing. We put it out for samples, and people ate it. It was also a little warm, but we stuck in jalapenos. And they said, what do you do with this? And we said, get a bar of Billy of cream cheese, pour it over the top, and you got a new burger. But anyway, I want to tell you about the Vidalia onion. Vidalia, Georgia needed a gimmick. So their chamber of commerce was standing around, and somebody was growing these, these onions. And they licensed it, called it, they repatented it with commerce as a Vidalia onion. So a and actually created them. And so I wanted to point that out. So um, it was time to, to increase um, our production. And we bought tabletop units of five gallons. Uh, we bought a 40 gallon kettle like that. I think it sat in the store upstairs for a year because the case, that's going to take $150 worth of ingredients just to make one batch. Um, what if it doesn't gel? Um, <laughs> Anyway, we were moving up into in the larger kettles, which was, was really nice. We did something crazy. Yeah. Um, I don't know whose harebrained idea of this was, but my sister-in-law cooked all these flower jellies. And making a blue jelly is damn hard, let me tell you, because it reacts with the vinegar. And so if you're trying to make blue, you're going to have greens. And she really worked to get this color down. That became our number one selling product, blue bonnet jelly. We're embarrassed to say that today, but you know, we weren't afraid to try anything. Everybody, we said everything's better with blue bonnet on it. Um, anyway, we created five flower jellies. They did well. Um, we created some of them. That little jar was really, really neat. Um, they started keeping records just like, like my mom had and my sister had, and we still have all those. Uh, we tried to, we had a whole line. I look at that today and it's an ugly set of conglomeration of, of labels I've ever seen. Um, not very creative and kind of a mixed match, but that, that was a slick. And I'm sorry I don't have any slicks for you today. I just went by the plant the other day and said, we don't do that anymore. And I said, I need to get here more often to see what you're doing. But we used to have all kind of every little line that we had, we had little colored slicks like this so you could, our, our people could see them. We did, this was really creative. And this is sometimes you create things in your 20 years ahead of your time. <clears throat> We created wine jellies. There were 17 wineries in Texas at that time, and every winery allowed us to buy their wine, gave us permission to miniaturize their label. And so we bought a different flavor of wine from each one of those, and we created the Texas wine jelly collection. Mm. And people looked at them and said, What the hell are you supposed to do with these? <laughs> so, why don't you get a bar of good drink cream to you? <laughs> I mean, people weren't very imaginative in the kitchen. It just really blows us away today thinking about that. I mean, if, you know, could they, not, if they must have been scared to death to follow a recipe, they would leave out something. We just operate different and we're throwing new things or leave something out to see what the result is. But this became an interesting project and we finally had to discontinue it. And we got some great press. I mean, it's the first time we got on a magazine cover or back cover, at least any cover was nice, Dominion. <laughs> Texas Highway. Um, we had some other crazy yeah, ideas. I tell you, we did Prince Kittle Market. And, um, so we made a wassail jelly. We could just create new things. 
What are you doing with a waffle jelly? Well, it's great on cream cheese too. <laughs> <laughs> but we made a beer jelly, and the beer jelly was kind of interesting. Um, we weren't afraid to do anything. But somebody in Germany, um, I have the letter, and I forget, it was about 10 years ago, um, well, more like 20 years ago, said, Do you have a recipe for that? Because we're being sued. Why are you being sued? Is it because we're making a beer jelly and someone else claims it. And apparently in Germany, it's a big thing, whoever's first. <laughs> and nobody else can, can make it. I don't know if it's a happy thing or what it is, but excuse me. So, you know, we can find a production receipt. So we sent it to them and they won the case and they successfully uh, won it. And so they said, you can have a free restaurant dinner in my restaurant. Whenever you get to this town in Germany, we have yet to go take a <laughs> But we don't make beer jelly anymore either. Um, it's really, really neat. Um, getting, press, getting press was really difficult. <clears throat> we couldn't really afford to advertise. Running an ad is, is terribly expensive. Um, really have no idea how, how expensive that can be. So. I think uh, Kathy Collier, let's see who came out and took this picture. Yeah, Kathy came out and captured a picture of the case and then we're making, you can see he has the wine jellies on the shelf. So he was a really, really young shaver. Uh -huh. they have all the CDS? He was born in 64, what is that picture? Oh. Yeah, so sure he was about 20. Um, Okay. You know, we've had a we've had a great relationship. We've yeah. never had an argument. We've never gone home mad. Um, there were two things that he suggested we do that I regret to this day. One of them was buying Krauss bottling works when they were going out of business and bottling the What do you want with that? The second one was two lots across the street from the peach house. There were twenty five thousand dollars allotments, and we don't have that type of money. After that, I just, whatever you say, let's go with it. He was, he was the, everybody loved him. Um, Kathy wrote this little article called Anna Jam. Well, we started doing a lot of festivals because from January to September, to kind of find a job teaching, it's a long way, it's time to wait. And so we had to do something. Peach season comes along in, in June. So we started doing shows. I uh, wanted to throw this in, but I'll come back to it. Um, the sugar industry is, is interesting. Let me let me save that and come back to it because um, it's not what I want to do right now. Um, we're often looking for ways to cut costs, and sugar was a big price in everything we made. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why you go to sweeteners mm -hmm. and other things. We started doing events, and of course, Oktoberfest was getting started. And we would set up a booth. We I built that booth and set up a display, and they would let us kind of expand beyond the 10 by 10 um, area. And we sample and created displays. And um, these were good money making weekends for us. We needed we needed the cash. Um, one of the newspapers captured this photograph of the case, which I think is really telling, because. He was really passionate about what he wanted to do. Now, this is a kid out of college that wants to do this. And uh, it, it was really, it was fascinating. I was appreciative that he wanted to do that. But what I didn't tell you earlier is when he, when we came, when he came home from college and we created Fisher Weezer Specialty Foods, I gave him a 40% interest. I said, if you walk away, you take 40% of all this with you. And I don't think he ever thought about that, but that was my commitment. I finally asked him to make him a full partner. So that was my investment in him. And I wanted him to know he wasn't working just by the hour. He was part of this. If he wanted to, to grow this. So we did we did all kinds of things. We were everywhere. Um, we finally got to the point where we wanted to do some fancy shows. And I said, we need we need a booth. And so I, this was kind of a bad sketch, but it is what I drew. And a fellow named Edmond Marquet built it. And we could take this apart and put it in a trailer. 
and we bought a trailer and we could now start doing big shows. We could go to, we could go to any show with all our trailer, with our product, and we could make money on weekends. I know you've heard of the Country Pebble show. We did all of them. That we could did all of them in Texas. I think it went to I think I did one in, in Mississippi with them. Um, there were great shows. You make four or five thousand dollars on a weekend. That was a lot of money in those days. And we had the cooks we were hiring and training in the kitchen. We didn't want to lose them because we didn't want to retrain new ones. And so we tried to keep them on. And so after peach season, we had a pretty good season with, with building our Christmas sales. But from January to May, we used all our money up and we started doing shows and we had to keep them busy uh, cooking things. We did kolache festivals. We went everywhere. I think this is the rattlesnake festival. And talk about, you know, rattlesnakes really stink. Um, but we did that too. Ever heard of a Sammy show? We did those. Oh, Houston wow. used to have a neat show downtown Houston. We would set up there and sell our product. Junior yeah, League, you'll love it. This one is getting in and qualifying for a Junior League show. You had to have a you had to have a neat presence. If you didn't have a neat image, then it wouldn't let you in. We had to dress up for Christmas. There's another one, the most famous one is this one, Mistletoe and Magic. Um, can't even read that one. <laughs> anyway, we did we did we did. We did all kinds of shows. We traveled everywhere. Casey and Deanna would go with their wagoneer in one direction. I would go in South Louisiana. Um, this was, they invited us in and it was really neat because they were nice people. And uh, we just used to give, after a while, we just gave all the profits to them to help them. So it's kind of fortunate that certain things happen at certain times, but this guy came along. Remember him? I do. <laughs> John, Jim High, John High Tower. Mm -hmm. um, he created the Taste of Texas program. And by joining membership, you got special fees in national shows. And so he was really good for our industry. For the first time, the Texans wasn't promoting just cows and sheep and goats and pigs. They would let flow companies like us participate. And so we got to do shows like in Paris. Wow. They would ship all our product. We, 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 didn't, we had to buy our own tickets in those days. Sometimes they could bought our airfare, but we would we paid our own. We went to Paris. I'm talking about stupid, but we did. I mean, this was great. We were in the big leagues. We're in the Texas Pavilion and the USA Pavilion. Um, we had a great time. We had a new catalog sheet to hand out, but nobody in France could read it. Oh, we got, <laughs> forgot to shake hands with the president of France. And that was really hilarious because we were we kind of had a corner booth and there was a door there and a door there. And one morning, Case and I show up and everybody's busy polishing up says, what's happening? So the president of France is coming in to see us. So, okay, we'll straighten our jars out. And it's only the big hurrah and the president comes in and he comes straight to us and shakes Case in my hands and goes out this door. And then we look over this way and everybody across the aisle from us is matter and hell. <laughs> The next, best, the next best thing that ever happened in case is getting married. And uh, this was his college sweetheart, Deanna. You all ever met Deanna? Yeah, yes. she is, she's a gem. She's a darling. And they married in 88. And so um, we've got to figure out how we're going to start making money. And we even did little wedding favors. I think it's the first time anybody ever went to a wedding got a jelly for <laughs> Anyway, um, I had by that time, you saw the farm, all the acreage. My, my parents believed in all their kids inheriting equally. So I got a fifth of that. I got a fifth of the house. I got a fifth of the farm and the ranch. I got a fifth of Arkansas, I got a fifth of buildings in town. And then it was left to us to, to trade. And so I would trade four or five acres. I had four acres out on a game of light for one acre at the Peach House. I was I, I just traded 260 acres in Arkansas for 15 acres. I made all kinds of deals until we had the farm put back together. And I think Case actually bought the um, five acres from my sister-in-law that I had nothing left to trade at this point. And so I had, when Case and Deanna got married, I had bought this house for $1,300. I 
I moved it out. Anybody, I was a sucker. Anybody who had a house to sell the river, so I'll move it. And I had moved it there. And I thought maybe someday we'll do something with it. Well, this was a great opportunity. I said, okay, okay, so I'm going to give you seven and a half acres, and you can take that to the bank and you can get money to restore the house. And so that's where they lived. And they, they moved in at the, the farm. We called it the Patricia Farmhouse. Um, the other thing Jim Hightower did for us is he gave us access to the Dallas Market Center. That was part of the program. And so for, for $100, we could have a $1,000 booth. I mean, it was, it was amazing what, what, the, what your tax dollars did for us. Thank you so much. Um, so we got into the Dallas Market Center. And but the market, the different market. Any of them on the market? Well, if you're if you're in the in the if you sell gifts, you go to the gift <coughs> shows. If, you, if you're selling furniture, you go to the furniture shows. And the market will set up, and all the furniture shops will be open during that time. But we went to the gift shows. All the gift shops were open that were support catering to gift shops, like the peach tree and ships and, and, sh and stores like that. And so they were creating a, a gourmet market downstairs. And I said, okay, this is a good idea. Let's just rent that all year long, because then we can set up our booth and keep it there. The gourmet center was something new. And so we moved in the same time they were creating that. And we set up a booth. Our first booth wasn't very attractive, um, but at least we got something open. And then we could keep it there. We could keep our literature there. And people, went, anytime they went to market, could pick, pick up the literature and place orders. And going to a show three or four times, three times a year like that was important for us because we'd write up to $50,000 in orders. I mean, it, it, was, it became a, a big cream uh, for us. The funny thing about growing a company is watching other companies either grow or crash. We met a lot of nice people at market and they set up their booths. And then they started, I don't know, I don't know what possessed them to look at us like as if we had money. But they would say, would you buy my company? <laughs> Are you crazy? We can't, we can't afford you. So, well, you haven't heard my offer. So we all required to listen to offers. Their offer was, please, we'll give you 50% of our company if you keep us from going bankrupt. So, all right, show us the numbers. So now I have all these numbers. Now I'm thinking bookkeeping 101 or accounting. So, by that time, Excel was coming along. We had computers, and I fell in love with Excel. And I could put all those numbers in, and then I could explain them out for you. It's fabulous. And the first thing I noticed about this company is that you haven't paid your bills in months, years. I mean, are you, how are your vendors still selling to you? So the first thing I did is I called the vendors. I said, hello, cheese company. Uh, I know you're supplying cheese to, to uh, this company. We're, we're trying to salvage it. I promise you we'll send you something this month, but you got to keep selling to us. We're going to pay this off. And every one of those vendors seemed to understand. And they would say, OK. And that's how you buy time, is talking to your vendors and suppliers. That was an important lesson. They obviously never learned it. So that's how we bought half the company. It was so bad, we finally went back and says, we need 60% of the company in this that okay. So we're learning stuff. And this is really amazing um, that that happens. Oh. The next guy that came along was with Moms. Ever heard of Moms? Oh, gosh. New York Times okay. named this the best pasta sauce in America before we owned it. I mean, it that's, that was the they reputation. They made basil and out of the soil. Yeah, the best. They named it New York Times. Only thing they ever got right. <laughs> wow. Amen. He comes to us and says, I want you to buy my company. And I said, look, um, $1.7 million? Are you kidding me? And, and how do you earn that type of money? And for a week, we negotiate and said, you know, if we can, there's no way we're not going to go in debt to, to do that. But the guy was desperate. About a month before that, somebody had flown into Dallas and he got in a car and drove to Fredericksburg and he had five soups and he had never marketed them, but he wanted us to buy his company. It was really cheap, $50,000. And the soups weren't anything special and he had all kinds of things on the, on, the, on, the, on the chalkboard. And one of the things he said, you can pay, pay me by the case. You can pay me 25 cents a case and then you pay it all. And we still said no, but that was still there. So we're talking to moms and says, okay, 
How about we give you a dollar with a dollar twenty five a case until we pay off one point seven five million dollars? And he said, okay. So we brought it, no, not a dollar down, and we took over the ownership of Moms. The thing about Moms that helped us more than anything else is this guy had national distribution. Oh. Do you know what that means? That means he had truck lines taken and yeah. stuff to warehouses <laughs> all across the country. Now we could piggyback Fisher and Weezer into those truck lines, oh. into those warehouses. Yeah. So it was worth a fortune to us. Yeah. But that's how we bought moms. It is still the best pasta sauce in America. We never tampered with this recipe, but we've added new recipes to it. So we keep creating new things. So that, that's, that's another way how you can grow. that change? Okay. Um, let me know if that's not changing properly. This was another company that um, a guy came to us and said, I want you to make a line for my for groceries. I've got a guy that used to just used to work with selling the groceries. Said, okay. And so we made a we created Oasis. All our recipes privately, we put his label on it. We did all the shipping. Well, he, he, he learned a a hard lesson about selling the grocery. There's not much money into it. And so he finally said, well, you buy me out. I said, okay, you know. Um, I forgot what we paid for this, but I need to ask Case. It wasn't much, but it's down to one product. Um, it really was just a competition with, with our product, and it was no point in continuing it. But we still make it. The next thing that happened in Fredericksburg was Main Street was developing. And funny thing about the early shoppers, they did all their shopping on Main Street and then they got in their cars and they zoomed home. And they went, we were still not open on the highway. There was no point in being open the rest of the year. The summer was, was peach month. So we finally decided, hey, we need to create a spot on Main Street. And so we created the Epicurean shop. And that gave us a presence on Main Street. And we, Opened the shop with all those furniture, with all that furniture you see in there in seven days. Had it all built and stopped, and we were open for business. And the Epicurean gave us seven days a week. We were open. I worked in that shop two and a half years straight with no break, and selling and meeting people coming in. We also sold wine at that time, which was um, there were only three wineries at the time. But that gave us a presence on Main Street that was really nice. Today, you might know it as Fisher and Weezer on Main Street. Um, it, it's a great presence, and I'm glad we have it. Uh, we started doing gift packs, and I'm kind of going <laughs> to, to show you the gift packs and not exactly the best packaging in the world. But um, it got us started. We're, we're nine years, eight or nine years into this process now. And it's, it's been a blast working with Case. But you can you can see the cases just thinking, what else is out there? What can we do next? And his his, his years or his years in college taking food science, and playing with flavors is, is is coming to a point where something has to happen. At at Dallas Market, we meet these two gentlemen. You ever been to Round Top Cafe mm -hmm. in Round Top, Texas? If you haven't, you must go. That was created by Bud Royer. He weighs about 350 pounds, yeah. and in those days, he sat on the front porch. Front porch. You mean him? He insulted everybody that came in, but he had a great cafe of people standing in line to eat. His kid and son run it down. The other fellow that we ran into at market was Rusty Fenton. Oh, back up on that. Rusty Fenton uh, is a creator of Rusty Tacos, and I think Rusty Tacos, uh, there are 220 stores like that today franchise. Rusty, Rusty was the guy that you went to if you had a billion dollars and you wanted your own store. He would create it for you. Flavor restaurant, we're talking about any kind of restaurant. He would write the menu. He would do everything with the turnkey patterns and everything. Let me give you some of the restaurant chains that are still in business. Ever heard of Uncle Julio's? Mm. Uh, Rusty Tacos. Um, Taco, Taco Rio, I can't even pronounce that one. 
How about Trader Vicks? Oh, yes. Wow. Okay. Um, Carlson Restaurants. Buffalo Wings Wow. Yes. Works. Buffalo Wow. He would go. He would create these, these recipes for these guys, and his own taco, Terrestri Tacos, is still still going. He became a dear friend. Unfortunately, we lost him not too many years ago. He was a great sounding board for case. He would come down and he'd work with us in the kitchen. He'd work in the stores. He was just a great, great friend. And uh, really regret he's not around anymore today. He died far too young. He introduced case to the Chipotle pepper. Nobody had heard of Chipotle pepper at this point. Case didn't ever heard of it. So that's where the Chipotle pepper fits in on the heat scale. Huh. And people are already scared to death of trying jalapenos. So you can imagine moving up one notch to Chipotle. But Case was looking for the next flavor profile, and Rusty suggested doing something with Chipotle pepper. So Case is in the kitchen, just like a mad scientist. He would send these samples out to Bud Royer and to Rusty. So tell us what, what do you think? Excuse me. On the day that he sent one of the samples of roasted raspberry chipotle sauce, both of those guys picked up the phone and called him within 15 minutes of each other. We had to mail it to him. That's a fact. And they said, stop whatever you've created in that profile, don't touch it. And that became the, what we call now the original roasted raspberry chipotle sauce. <laughs> um, we should have patented, but we didn't. And so you're going to see a lot of them on the market today. But um, we were nominated for having the best selling product in America. And we didn't, we didn't know about that. We were selling to two supermarkets at the time. Rice Epicure, never been to their shops. I don't even know if they're still in business in Houston. And the other one was, was uh, Jim Mayles. They're family stores. I'm not, not sure they've, I'm not sure they've survived. But, Stores like HEB and Kroger and I said big stores wouldn't look at us. And then when they kicked me out of the store, it was, you know, come back, you know, some other day. They just, you couldn't get into those stores. We wanted to be in the stores, but these two nominated us for having the best selling product in the United States. And I have to explain that there is a fancy food show. You ever heard of it? What is it in New York? It was in Chicago. In, uh, in LA or San Francisco once a year. Um, the Fishers just came back from Las Vegas and it was uh, just held last week, last weekend. Um, we used to set up, I'm gonna show you the booths we used to set up, but they're very difficult to get into, very expensive. I mean, you write a big check to, to be there. To be nominated as having the best selling product and there were 1400 nominations. And I said, wow, well, that's a nice honor. When it got down to five, I said, maybe Kate, maybe you need, you need to go. And so um, Case flew up to New York to accept the award. This is like winning the Academy Award in food business. Um, they, they stand about this tall, they're heavy, you could really make harder, harder, you know, you could really kill somebody with them. Um, they're very difficult to win. They mean nothing to the average population unless you're in the food business. But they're very difficult to win. Uh, this this really gave us a start that we would never have imagined. And case called about 9:30 that night and said, "Guess what? We've won it." <laughs> and it gave us recognition. And so that's why we can say on our sign at the roadside, "This is the home of the original." Roasted raspberry chipotle sauce. And I had, we had a lawyer on the firm. We might have trademarked the other part. And because a lot of companies have used it, and there's nothing you can do about that. But Chase created a mouthful of words of, of roasted raspberry chipotle. Number one, I have a lot of fun reading recipes of our competitors. And when they actually suggest in taking the raspberries to roast them, you just almost want to crack that. Um, Chipotle pepper is a roasted jalapeno. And so you don't roast the raspberries, but he decided to call it that. And it has become a trademark. I mean, everybody says that roasted raspberry chipotle sauce. So we invented that. That's ours. 
um, we have trademarked as the original. I want to point out, I may have pointed this out, that a hundred years earlier, a German down in Nevada introduced the chili powder, introduced chili powder itself to the American palate for the first time. First time, a hundred years earlier. So I don't know what's wrong with all these Germans coming over here and inventing stuff that are inventing it, giving it to Americans, but I thought it was kind of neat. Um, we've won 12 more of these awards. So it's really prestige. I do want to point out this one. Did I miss the Chipotle restaurant? There is a Chipotle restaurant, but they didn't, they, they use Chipotle as a name, not as a pepper in any of their products. So it, you are going to see it. Um, we started doing different things. Um, you know, we used to tell people to stir it up and pour it over the cream cheese in case I had a bright idea to wipe, wipe this, take the pectin out of stuff and make a sauce. So now we're in the sauce business. So our whole history has been an evolution. And who would, I mean, we couldn't have started with this first. We had to hurt, but the 1015 onion product, I don't know how many sauces we make. We make a, we make a bunch. Well, winning, winning meant everything. Um, it's worth a quarter million dollars in instant sales. And now we have a problem. We have just a very small kitchen. How are you going to cook a truffle of 12 pallets to put on the truck? And so the next question we had to do was to find a way to produce in quantity. And so, you know, you say hello to banks and if you show them what you just want and they go, yeah, well, you know, <laughs> show us the numbers. And we couldn't show us the numbers. And so the only thing we could do was to set the farm. And so, you know, family didn't, my family didn't have the millions that it took to put in the equipment that we now needed. And so we did, we bet the farm. And uh, you can see the farm, that's pretty much how it looks today, except uh, that big square spot at the top is all full of new peaches. And we had rented, uh, actually, we had bought the last half of the Old Style Lumber Company. And uh, we started putting the equipment in there. It's very expensive equipment. We bought everything used. The case flew all over the United States, sourcing equipment. It took a while to, to get it together, um, but we can produce, um, did I say, almost two truckloads a day today. Um, have a lot of product. I wish we could do tours. If we ever can raise another $20 million, we'll build a plant that we can have tours at. <laughs> One of the things that Case insisted on immediately. Um, this is our test kitchen, by the way. Every batch that we make gets a number and we taste it the next day. Every batch. And we keep a record of that. We keep a library of everything we produce. In case we need to retrace a batch, we get somebody complains about finding a fish hook in their product. Um, it would be funny what some people call about. And we can say, yeah, here it is. Um, this is our test kitchen. This is a private little kitchen where we, where we create new products every day. We create five new products a week. And we have a library that is unbelievable. And but we taste all the products. The case made a really brilliant move um, in bringing his friend home, which is my niece, Jenny. And she earned her PhD in summa cum laude at Texas a and um, She went from bachelor's straight into a, into a doctorate program. She is really brilliant. And um, I had her in class in, 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 when I taught her world history, and she was the one student I ever had in 15 years that I really had to stay ahead of because she was sharp. And her brother was, her, her dad was really, really smart. Um, he wanted, Case wanted her here. And my sisters were having conniptions because one of them had a PhD working in a college that you're giving up. You, you have a PhD and you're going to go work in a jelly kitchen at the beach house? Are you kidding me? I mean, what are you thinking? But it's been a great move because Jenny, Jenny has a budget mind and um, she is great at, at maintaining quality control and recipes. She just understands the workings of recipes and what, what they do. Um, it's very important that, that we have a good track record and you can see the awards that we get. I think, I mean, you know, it's getting weak to a point I can't really see anymore. Um, I think last year we scored about a hundred percent or real close on one of the inspections. We actually welcome inspections. 
Some of these are announced, some are not announced. They're going to come in, they're going to check everything in your production. We're in a lumber company that, that can score this high. Nobody scores these scores, um, even in, in state of art factories. And Jenny is responsible for that. So we're, we, we look forward to being judged because it's a good advertising point. It tells a lot about uh, our, our care for products and our standards. Um, Jenny's been in the the other thing we had to do was, was learning how to market. And about this time, this little thing came up for auction. It's unbelievable how much we can offer for this. No price is high enough yet, but this, this, this jelly.com, um, I don't think a month goes by that I don't get a call with somebody offering me money for this. I don't know what kind of, what kind of products they're making, but um, Case, Case told me to watch this one. There was a time when computer nerds were, were coming up with everything and they had 28 day auction. And for 28 days, I had to follow this guy in North Dakota to and call in and say, we still high bidders. I bid $850 with 30 minutes to go. I called him and um, it's midnight. And I said, okay, are we still the high bidder? And he said, mm, just a minute, let me call someone. <laughs> so I waited, he called back, said, you got it. We bought it for $850. I don't know how much we're going to offer for it. I'm thinking the high end, $300,000. Uh, this has been, it's been unbelievable. And you don't get to keep them, except we've got it locked up for decades to come. And uh, Case is very sharp. We locked up a lot of, a lot of that com uh, that he keeps uh, active. Learning to advertise is something um, that is really interesting. We didn't have a lot of money for, for running ads. Um, I look at the magazines today and I'm looking at all the dollar signs that those things are costing us. Uh, we couldn't afford that. And you try to get free publicity where you can. And so if somebody sticks a microphone in front of your mouth, um, you got to know what to say in three minutes or less. And you got to with the questions they're asking you. And we actually brought in somebody, what did I do? We actually brought in someone to train us because people were sticking microphones in front of our mouth. Tell us about winning the national award. What, what else have you got? And so we, we, we hired somebody to train us and we, we flew everybody to Houston to Central Market that had that upstairs cooking school. And for a full day, we trained our staff and they trained us on what to say. And they, they kind of forced it out of us. You know, they would, in morning sessions, you, know, you had to write things down and we would talk about it. In the afternoon, we actually practiced the TV cameras and radio. They did all that for us. And it was really uh, an eye-opening experience because free advertising is free. And it can be very expensive to someone, but we can't afford it. So these are the things we try to say. I've forgotten most of them because nobody asks me anything anymore. But I think there were seven things. And if you had three or four minutes on live TV or live camera, you try to get two of the Indians in and, and say what it is. But twist of the wrist and you can be a gourmet chef and all those things. It was kind of fun. We started doing the fancy food show now in earnest. We've done it before. We used to send a 10 by 10. Now we started doing 40 by 10. Um, the amount of money that costs to send 11 people to go work that show is wow. astronomical, but that was, that was our field. And that's what we did. We did these in New York, we did them in San Francisco. And in Chicago, they finally quit there in Chicago. I would go up uh, usually two or three days early. We'd have all our booths, all our packaged containers, they'd arrive. I'd unpack them and put them back together and get all the product that by that time I was kind of what we say in German for foot. And the other group came in to sell. We have we've had great employees. We love our employees. So that's that's a it costs a lot of money to do that. But this is place we sat down with our vendors and we had one-on-one -on -one relationships and that was important. These were big vendors, they were national vendors and they wanted to see you. They wanted to see what's new to them. So we had to keep coming up with new products. What's and that was kind of drove us on our side that we had to do. One of the biggest customers that, that we sought out initially was Costco. And um, grocery just really wasn't looking at us at that time. Grocery is, is, is a, a tough sell. And what Case did with Costco is says, we'll give you a free power, a free pallet. We'll set it on the floor, sample it, and tell us what you think. 
And Costco said, not only yes, but hell yes. And we've been in Costco ever since. And we're there. Costco operates, I think, in seven regions of the United States. So you have to sell each region. And I don't know which one we're in at the moment, but we do have done extremely well at Costco. And yet I hear people come back, you your product on Costco. Well, that's because Costco operates differently. We have to understand how your vendor works at store. And so they put stuff on the farm, they'll sell it out, and then they want people to scream about it, and then they'll bring it back in, or they'll have a special. So sometimes I'll go to Costco and I'll see three or four of our products in the floor, which is remarkable. Sometimes nothing, but Costco has done very well for us. We have a great relationship with them. And then we um, this palace you see at the warehouse any day. We met this gentleman and sometimes funny things happen to you. He just came into the plant. And I want to I wanna see Kate, whoever runs this plant. His name is out of Cancun. Alex Cantu was born in Monterey, Mexico, and went to the University of Ohio and met his sweetheart there, married an American, and went back to Mexico City, where he became the head honcho with, with um, I can't think of which one, <laughs> a famous whiskey, Jose Cuevo. Okay. And um, for 26 years, they're buddies. And apparently in Mexico, when a, a new CEO comes in, he brings this new accounting guy in. And so 26 years later, the guy retires and he's out of a job, basically. I mean, he's made a lot. But one of the things he did for Jose Cuevo says, I have this hot sauce that you need to be making. And of course, Jose Cuevo said, hey, we're making this. This is Cholula. That's his product. He got Jose Cuervo to make it. It has a wooden top on top. Anyway, he drops in to see Case. He says, I like the smell of your product. And he says, um, do you have a business plan? <laughs> we feel like, no, um, I no, we're supposed to have one. And he says, I can do a business plan for you. I said, okay. And so Case is always, Case is the guy that can read the books, 21 successful kids, successful businessmen. He'll read those. I can't stand him reading the titles, but he, he dwells on those. So when this guy came in, he says, I'll do it. And so we took all our senior personnel and for a week, we were at Peach House and where the cooking school is. And he came in and, and taught us about developing a five-year plan. And it was really, really interesting how that happened. By Thursday afternoon, we're chomping at the bits because we got this. And for the first time, we really, really, really understand that we're going to survive. We're going to be here forever if we don't do stupid things. But that was a blast. And he's the man responsible for it. Well, he did that. We liked him. He and Case got along great. So he went to work for us as a salesperson. And wow. then he retired and moved to Austin. And sadly, he's passed away. But he was, he was one of those people that you meet along the way that, that is really, really interesting. Um, I know you've heard of SDS, this is direct store delivery. We have trucks pulling up at our plant. Um, HEB pulls up all the time. They have a huge distribution warehouse in, in San Antonio. Uh, we actually ship truckloads to Costco and Kroger. The Kroger story is kind of interesting. We're, we learned to, um, the guy that had Oasis Foods, I told you about, has Oasis restaurants in Austin. Oh, yeah. He happened to have um, three condominiums overlooking Acapulco Bay. And so we started renting the entire condominium. It comes staff with your own bar. You put the liquor in, but 24 hours, seven bartending. They cook all our meals for us. They've got the pools. They take us all around the pool. So and after 20 years, they've become really like family to us. So we like going off the pool. Um, but um, I lost track when I was going with that. But anyway, <laughs> need to write things down. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I'll, I'll come back to it. We're in Acapulco and um, we, we learn Okay, I'm having a senior moment in a minute. Don't tell anybody this. But anyway, let me go on. Um, the other other way we distribute is, is, is through distributors. And distributors actually buy your product. 
And so sometimes people ask us, well, are you in my store? And we say, we, we don't know because we don't sell to that store directly. We sell to a distributor. And distributors take their cut of the action. Um, they, they can be useful. They can also be uh, vindictive. Uh, I think the first time we got, a, 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 we see, you know, sell $100,000 to somebody like Tree Alive and you get your check at the end of the month and it's for $10,000. And you look at all the deductions they take away. So next time you knock over a jar at HEB, don't feel bad for HEB because they're going to bill it to that company. <laughs> and so when you sell to stores, they're going to get all breakage. Um, oh, we had you know 10% breakage on this, or somebody stubbed their toe. All the deductions we learned to fight those. In fact, is we have one person in accounting that fights all of them every time, because we're not going to take 90% deductions. These guys are almost criminal. And uh, that's probably why they won't call the mafia. I'm not maybe all of these, but uh, distributors can kill you if you're not careful. So we learned a lot about distributors and how they operate. Um, these are some of the stores that we're in. Uh, Kroger, for example, I think has uh, 200 stores. The president, oh, that's what I wanted to say. The president, we're in Alpha Poco and the president of Kroger calls case. So I want you to fly up. To, or their, list, their chief buyer calls and says, the president wants you Monday morning. Okay, so says, I'm in Acapulco. <laughs> you need to be here. So he flies up uh, to meet with the chief buyer program. And um, the guy says, we want you in all our stores. And Kate says, you flew me up here for this? The answer is no. And the guy and the president gets involved and says, what are you talking about? You know, we're a huge store. So well, I'll tell you why. Number one is if we're in your warehouse, it's going to wind up in every store in your chain. And there are some stores in the 200 neighborhoods that you don't want to be in because it's like a teacher giving a zero. You need to get a bunch of zeros after this kid. You know, he's going to pay up. He's out of there. In the in the food and in the grocery business, if you get too many zeros, that throws you out of everything. So we we don't want to be in that low neighborhood. No offense to the people living there, but it's not going to sell for you. It's not going to sell for us. And we're throwing out. So Kroger was taken aback. The president of Kroger went, "She got to be kidding me," and he understood. And he said, "Okay, case, give me eleven months." True to his word, 11 months later, Kroger calls and says, we're ready for you. And so their warehouse is now segmented. Our product goes into Kroger and it goes into all these certain stores. And not many, not, not many grocery stores will work with you like that, but, but Kroger will. Um, getting off track again. These are also food distributors. You might see their trucks running around town. They sell the Benny Keith. They sell the grocery. They sell the, you know, the, the uh, restaurants. Um, this is the evolution of, of our label. Um, it's amazing that we even survived the changes, but we're always trying to get better. So I don't know, I think we're the last one on the right. It's the one where we're at now. It probably changed about the time I get back to the plant. Uh, we like to be, uh, these are all our competitors. Every one of these, I went online and I looked at the recipes I told you earlier. This is, this is two dozen that use our logo and don't come anywhere near. Um, if I was selling the jellies roadside, you know, selling a jar of peach preserves, who would ever dream of selling $100 million of one flavor? So that's what roasted raspberry hopefully has done to us in all of these years. I'm not saying we do that all the time, but, but that was, that's the significance of this flavor and what it's meant to us, it's, it's really amazing. We cook, as I said, five new flavors a week. We keep them on file. People come to us and say, I want something for my company. We do private labeling. Tell us what you have in mind and we can pull this like a library. Jenny can, and she pulls them out and says, try this, and then we can tweak it. We'll go from there. What do you want changed? And we make special labels. Um, these are some of the other brands, uh, other uh, flavors of first that we do. Um, it's been a lot of fun doing this. Um, I got to play with Export about a decade ago, maybe two decades, I forgot when. Um, there was another program that came along that followed Jim Hightower's. It was called Build Texan Program. And again, you, you sign up 
and honest to God, they would fly me to, they flew me around the world twice, let me put it that way. Uh, I, I got to go play and export. They would ship my product. They would translate uh, our literature. Uh, they would do everything for us. And sometimes I had to buy an airfare ticket, but they had to take up the hotel fee. They would translate all our literature in whatever language we needed. I would have private guides, even some of the countries I went to. Um, I had a blast and um, cases, let's see what happens. And the crazy thing that we discovered about export is, is basically the truth about our Congress and, and the way that our government operates. But I had, I had some great trips. Sometimes I had just a tabletop. And the nice thing about these is that nobody came to sit down across that table that didn't know these products. In other words, the government or ahead of time would say, you want to listen to these guys? And if they said, no, uh, you didn't waste your time with people that weren't interested in you. Sometimes I got chauffeured to their, their factories in person, at one on one. Um, Sometimes I had more booth <coughs> in Sao Paulo, Brazil. I had my own chauffeur, no car. It took all day to get from one side of town to the other. <laughs> Sao Paulo is unbelievable. It's the richest per capita city in the world. Um, Brazil, a um, beautiful city, but just, just impossible to get across town. They need a highway. Um, SASTA, the Southern US Trade Association would pay all these things for us. It's amazing what they would do, um, translating all our brochures, having guides for us, making labels, making changes. And it was really amazing to see our tax dollars at work. And some of the signs that I've had in different places, translated, uh, went to Germany several times, met a lot of nice people, uh, had a blast. Um, Sosta always treated us nicely back down in Mexico City. One thing I like to do is I used to, I used to go up a day or two before the show started or whatever event I had. And then I would, I would visit the stores and have the grocery. It's, you know, if I go to Paris, I'm going to a grocery store. You, know, you go see the Eiffel Tower. That's the difference between us. Um, but this was a market. This market was 150 years old in you know, Santiago, Chile. And it was unbelievable to displace. If I could just teach my students, you know, my kids, in my roadside market, the importance of display. And the is just so difficult to teach. Anyway, this was my interpreter in Hong Kong. Went there twice. I don't know where I am there. So I'm Australia. Australia is neat. People are nice. Um, went all around the world. These are actually two employees. So Mr. Gans is on the right. Um, that's a guy that created Oasis yeah, for his brother in law and then came to work for us. He was a wonderful salesman. Unfortunately, he was, he's since passed away. Um, I travel a lot. I've been to the grocery store. This, this is why we can't export. These are the taxes. If I sell a $100,000 container to somebody in Sao Paulo, Brazil, they're going to have to write a check for $85,000 to their government. These are tariffs. Take a look at the EU. 17%. So they're writing a check for $17,000 for the right to import our product. After a while, it, it's this case we can't compete. <clears throat> I mean, it, um, this is not, it's not fair. I mean, I don't know why the government is spending money sending us there when they never tell us these type of things. We found it out later. Um, this is what I wanted to show you earlier. As Americans, it's illegal for you to buy candy outside the United States. Did you know that? Look, if we could save 10 cents on every pound of sugar, how more competitive we could be. It used to be double, it used to be double. Um, so the world is catching up to the, the sugar lobby in the US. Take a look at what the sugar lobby spends on all in Congress. <laughs> they absolutely own Congress. There's no way your rep is gonna tell you he's gonna fight to end that. So that's the quandary that, that we're in as a manufacturer on the world market. We've tried, we, we, have, we just shipped this container to, um, to the UK, a second container right now. Case is gonna apply 
to London on Sunday to meet it. So they're buying. I don't, I don't know what the UK does right now. They, they pulled out of the EU, so I don't know the taxes. But in, in Continental, in the UK, it's in, in, sorry, in the EU, it's 17% still. And you heard Trump tearing up all these trade agreements. That was one of the reasons. It's not a fair footing for American business. So sugar on the sugar industry owns Congress, period, lock, stock, and barrel. And uh, they're buying off everybody. You can go to HEB. You can buy these two products made in Switzerland. Uh, yeah, both of them in Switzerland for four dollars and twenty-five cents. This was done two years ago, so I didn't get that updated. Four dollars and twenty-five cents. That same jar, if you go to Italy, where I was just three years ago or less, it's not. It's seven seven ninety-five euro, nine ninety-five American dollars. So what do we do when we like to travel? We go to foreign countries, we take cooking classes, we participate in the whole family sometimes. Um, we visit markets. I love visiting markets. I just love it. I mean, I mean the markets are so beautiful. I mean, they know display really well. Um, we take the whole family. There's Simon on the, the left. I think you see Jenny and Case. Case has, I'm sorry, Deets. Deets has Deets Distillery now. In case we take cooking classes all over the world, or where we go, we taste restaurants, we go to the food. Our business is defined the next Chipotle, and it's really, really hard to do. I don't think it'll ever happen <laughs> again in my lifetime. Um, we eat at nice restaurants, we look on the menu, say, what is the chef doing? Sometimes we go in the kitchen and talk to chefs. At least case can do the deets. This is um, this is the <laughs> This is Alfa Foco. Maybe some of y'all are afraid to go to Mexico. And yeah. we go to probably the dirtiest market, not because it is the dirtiest, but you can imagine how dirty a market can be in Mexico, like Monterey, Mexico. This is probably one of those. But the, the food that we find in there is incredible. And this little taco stand is one we visit every time. Because that guy puts out the best tacos in the world. So we, we're still, we still go. Um, I've been in London, definitely taking cooking classes, had a lot of fun doing that. Uh, what else do we do? We eat nice restaurants, we try foods. Does that look pretty appetizing? Yeah. That's in my kitchen at home. <laughs> We grew up with charcuterie and we didn't know it. <laughs> we had dried sausage, we had the jerky, we had all this stuff, yeah. all that stuff in the beginning. And it, it, it didn't register, but that's, that's in my kitchen. And uh, we, we enjoy charcuterie is so much fun. You ever heard of the word before? I mean, it was sometimes, <laughs> I remember when it first came out, people couldn't say it, I couldn't say it. It's another cooking class we did. I think this one was in Italy. Um, we designed a new logo, I guess we're a lot of hot air. Um, I don't know how long I've kept you or whether I'm over time or behind time, I just don't know. I hate this thing, it sucks. Go up. Um, this is our cooking school. We had a lot of fun with that. We are open again now. We do private classes. Um, again, we on all these trophies. Um, about three years ago, Better Homes and Garden came by and did a seven page spread. That was really interesting watching how they photograph food and how long it takes them to get a display ready. I just look at that and my mom used to lay in bed reading Better Homes and Garden. And I think, wonder if she ever thought someday that she'd be reading about her story next <laughs> So there's the peach house. We try to make it pretty. We've had 53 years of this. Um, it's still a bunch of shacks to some people, I guess. But we had 169,000 visitors last year. COVID was unbelievable to us. Unbelievable. Um, I can't really see what that is. That's so. Oh, yeah, that's inside the store. Um, some days we sample up to 175 products. Um, it's amazing. It's, it's the best way to get people to try your product. Um, but anyway, I told you that the lake is pretty, prettier than I ever thought it would turn out to be. We watch a lot of sunsets. We enjoy our grounds. And uh, this orchard, unfortunately, is being slowly demolished. 
technology PhD is not last long. This is just three years ago. You should see it today. Peaches just die, and um, I'm, I've been wanting to take it out and bulldoze it and cut a new orchard in place. Um, we actually grow that truck into that side and that's run it a number of years. <laughs> and we have fun with it. Uh, sunsets are beautiful. Uh, we have other brands that you probably never heard of. This one was made for AGB, it's called Good Truck. I know there are probably nine flavors of that. We're creating new flavors all the time. Um, this is um, this is the line that we make. Um, Dr. Fu is a PhD from a &M. She was had a restaurant in Austin. We were making a lot of products for her under her label. And then with her help, we created these. These are our flavors. Jenny helped create all these. It's called Dr. Fu's brand, and they're just absolutely stunning. Um, it's just amazing to taste all these different foods, but none of them are ever going to be that second roasted raspberry chipotle chum. And that was a once in a lifetime. This was four star provision, or is four star provision. I think we started that, we make that for HEV. Um, we have a lot of different labels. Um, we also have wine. Um, the youngest son is Simon, and he's a graduate of Napa Valley Wine School. He lives in Austin and works with his mom because uh, he just likes Austin. I'm trying to get him out of that town, but he likes it. And he's working with his mom on wine food. He, um, he developed these wines for us. And Messina Hope is, is uh, the winery that makes them for us. We don't intend presently to become a winery that's a whole different ballpark. But we do, Simon do, did develop these wines. And they're kind of neat, and that's Simon. He's the youngest, <laughs> and uh, he's a great kid. They're all great kids. Um, this distillery is now open. You need to go. I'm missing my afternoon martini. I had never had a martini in my life until he opened up. Um, and you've got margaritas. What do you want martinis for? Because I'm, I'm learning. I said, okay, I'm going to drink martinis all week just, just to understand what martinis are. So I went up the menu and um, I, had, I had a lot of fun. My bill was $2,000 last month, but I would buy drinks for <laughs> Dietz is the oh, oldest fisher. He's a remarkable kid. Uh, just, and it's been such a pleasure growing up with these kids and being part of this family. Uh, Dietz is multi -test. He can drink and drive us. Uh, he designed his, his own building. I didn't have a current photograph of it. But he thinks kind of like I do. He's, he's a fantastic guy. I was sitting in the lobby the other day and people were coming in and he had this spiel and it was, he knew everything. He knew all their history. And I said, I don't know if I ever taught you all this, but he just mixed it up. And it's, it's just amazing. Um, this is one of his, um, I'll probably barely got going before the last peach is So he does have a peach liqueur that he made or Kool-Aid, I don't even know what they call this stuff. And a pear from the local pears, our pears for our, from our peaches. So it's only got three products right now. So I'll bring your pocket check. Um, we still have the fan at the corner. I kind of got kicked out of the peach house, so I moved to the corner, which is a good location. I'm not involved in the fan anymore. They kind of decided I needed to retire, so I, I still manage the orchard, which I'm trying to get rid of. Um, but anyway, um, we have fun growing peaches. I, this, I took this put around in 1969. I didn't grow these. This is a Halberta giant. And they're all kinds of peaches. You can go to you can go to any kind of store and buy a peach. But what is this brand? You're not going to find a Halberta giant again. But it was a big, beautiful peach, and it had one crop. Ever. <laughs> the guy in the animal cup grew these. Uh, that 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 half bushel sold for six dollars, and I had people stop out of the stores for six dollars for that. Well. 1969, it was like $60. It was, it was expensive. I think last summer, I forget my prices, but I think I had a it was $145. Uh, unbelievable. Prices are crazy. I love this white. It's not a good display. Um, we do have the stand. It's kind of neat. Um, I wish we could be open here around. This is Case. Um, I've known him since he was, what, 17? Um, so he's been great. 
it's been it's been wonderful. I don't think many partnerships say that. Um, 2019, these people came by and said, you're the best stand in the county, now give us $160. And we said, no, we got to keep them. Got to keep that. Um, um, there's no contest for that. It just doesn't exist. Uh, we had a lot of fun a few years ago, had um, magic, three nights and trades. We burned $500 for this pay to save the crop. We believe in participating in, in all the events, so we do. That must be Santa Claus comes to town. Fourth uh, of July, um, Kate's next to set up front. I've got to sit in the back, but we're just watched with parade for one. This is Deets. Deets is, Deets is great. All the kids are great. Um, when I can't make the parade, they have a little cutout. <laughs> Thanks to the women. Kate's is very active in the community. He's a former president of the Chamber of Commerce. I can't read all those things anymore, um, but you can read through them. We believe in serving our community. Uh, Deanna is also very active. She's worked uh, at the hospital um, <coughs> the foundation for many, many years. Uh, we all went through leadership class. Um, Jenny is phenomenal with her PhD and the things that she's done. She's very active in the hospital. Um, Community, I think she's president of the Chamber of Commerce. Or at that time, they called it president and chairman now. Um, I find it, I've done a few things too. And I'm sorry, but that's all, folks. <laughs> um, I guess I'm not here. These are things that, that we believe in. I'll go back so you can have this. These are really important things for us. Um, nothing is more important than the family. And, we have all the family involved now, and uh, even Ellie, which will come out in a minute. Um, there's no point in making anything unless it's the best. That's why we test new things every day. And we have a lot of fun. A lot of people come to our plant and say, the workers seem too happy. And I'm thinking, are we paying you too much? Um, no, we really have a, it's really a family spirit. And, I, can, I don't think we've ever, ever posted by a clocking light or anything for it, but things like that, it's delicious. We believe in integrity, the, the, the key motto, and maybe it's part of the reason for our success. Um, we want to give service. I remember one time a lady was called in case and she was irate, and he's on the phone, and he's saying, okay, we're gonna, well, I'm going to do something for you, but I just don't know what it is right now. We try to make our customers happy. We'll buy back products. Somebody looks in the ice box and says, this expired in 2006. We won't give you an HR. I mean, we have an equivalent of that. But service is important to the fishers and all of us. Faith is it's crucial. It's gotten to us through some hot spots. Again, making top quality. Uh, I'm trying to start a new trend. Uh, Simon and I went on a trip uh, two years ago, visiting roadside market from here to to Minnesota, and we kept seeing the barn signs, people painting their barns, it was like a quilt. And then they're really quilt trails. You can take barn quilt trails in the, in the Midwest. In the East. So I'm trying to get one started, but you know, very few people copy us. So that one I need to take down and repaint now. Um, this, this was that orchard orchard, which really wants the best orchard in, in town. Um, Case has been fun to work with. It's been a pleasure. Um, Again, we do a lot of parades, we take a lot of photographs. This is this is Ellie. Ellie is, is working with Beats right now in the distillery. So we brought her in and we've got all three kids working in the family. Uh, I can't think of many families being able to work with all their kids. So that's really great. So that's all folks. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming. Does anybody have any other questions? Yeah. Uh, on those, uh, on the import taxes, what is our import tax to the other countries? So we charge none and- and uh, Nobody's protecting our industry. 
Uh -huh. Now that depends what industry you're in. If you're in the automotive industry, there might be some. But okay. if you're in the jelly business, you're not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it, it 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 really varies product to product. Oh, I can tell you it's And so how do you find out? I mean, how do you? Well, I Google a lot. I Google a lot. This is scheduled 4:30.